education is not just about empowering people. It's not just about the practice of freedom. It's also in some ways about killing the imagination. And, and in some ways educating people to adjust the conditions in which their own sense of agency is basically limited. For instance, we often see pedagogies that teach to the test. We often see pedagogies that are simply about accountability, objective standards, um, pedagogies that in no way take into consideration the experience of students, in no way speak to important social issues. They're pedagogies that in, in, in many ways are designed to undercut the possibility for students to be critical thinkers, to be critically conscious, to be aware of their, their own cultural capital and its strengths and their place in the world. And I think that it's rightly so to call those pedagogies pedagogies of repression. The debate about education today, and it, with its emphasis on methods, represents a new kind of pedagogical stupidity because it, it completely ignores the most fundamental question of education, and that is, what is education for? And it, it ignores the most fundamental struggle inherent in education, which is a struggle over identities, a struggle over agency. Education in the final analysis is really about the production of agency. You know, what kind of agents are we going to produce? What kind of narratives are we going to produce that students can understand that enlarge their perspective on not only on the world, but on their relationship to others and themselves? And I think that methods, to begin with methods, is to completely ignore probably all the most fundamental questions about education, ideology, culture, power, authority. How are these things constituted? What's the basis for knowledge? Who has the authority to implement it? In what way does it speak to a particular kind of future? Because all education is an introduction in some way to the future. It's a struggle over what kind of future you want for young people. It's a struggle over the kinds of subjectivities that would make that future possible. It's a struggle over notions of narrative that students can relate to and in some way understand so they can see education as being fundamental to who they are and how they relate to the world. Methods doesn't do that. Methods contain a kind of silence on the, on the side of the worst forms of repression, it seems to me, because they deny the very notion that students are alive. To, to, to can be alive to both themselves, to particular forms of knowledge, particular forms of social experiences, and particular values. The notion of neutrality and when it's raised in education is the worst form of politics. In itself, it's a political issue. It's a political question because it's taken a value around education in ways to hide what education is really about. I've always, I've always viewed that position as the basis for a kind of fascist politics, because it hides its code for not allowing people to understand the role that education plays ideologically, the role that it plays in producing particular forms of knowledge, particular forms of power, particular kinds of social values, particular notions of agency, particular narratives about the world. It's impossible for education to be, to be neutral. There's no such thing as a neutral education. So those who argue that education should be neutral are really arguing for a version of education that's not in, in which nobody's accountable. That the people who produce that form of education disappear. They become invisible because they're saying it's neutral. And so you can't identify the ideological processes, politics, modes of power at work. And that's precisely what they want. I mean, look, power at its worst is invisible. It makes itself invisible. And I think that a new, the notion that education is, is neutral uh, is, is, to me, one way of people who have dominant power making it invisible and making propaganda itself incapable of being seen. It seems to me that at the heart of critical pedagogy is, is, uh, is that it's not just about, it's not a skill. We're not talking about skills, you know. We're, we're talking about critical consciousness. You know, conscientization, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about what does it mean to create the tools where people can be not only critics, uh, but can be cultural producers. And I think that what the new technology offers for young people, particularly for young people, is the opportunity to operate outside of traditional spheres of the media, particularly the mainstream media, uh, in ways that they've never had that opportunity before. At the same time, we also see the way in which that, the new media, the new technologies have become enormously weaponized in the interest of repressing people. Google, Facebook, I mean, these are really increasingly technologies of surveillance. That's basically what they are. But that doesn't mean that there aren't enormous possibilities for these technologies to be used, and we've seen them used in relatively progressive and radical ways. I mean, my theory about those technologies is that we have to judge them within the societies 
that, that are, uh, are using them according to very specific values. So it's not that the technology alone you know, causes, produces very specific relationships. They operate according to the values that basically align with certain modes of power to put into play how those, those things would be used. Selfies, you know, selfies are the mirror of neoliberalism, right? I mean, uh, but selfies don't have to be. Disabled people can project modes of representation that dignify who they are. It's a struggle. All of these technologies are part of a larger struggle over cultural politics. In the beginning, when these technologies emerged, there was a kind of romanticization about these technologies, saying that this is the new democracy, right? Because they divorced those technologies from questions of power and the concentration of power and how the concentration of power can basically absorb almost anything in a capitalist society, particularly a neoliberal society. And I think that has to be challenged. I mean, I think that what we're seeing now, uh, I, I think you have to be pretty stupid to believe that Google is you know, somehow on the side of democracy, right? You have to be pretty stupid to believe that Microsoft really cares about social justice. You, know? you have to be pretty stupid to believe that in some way Twitter you know, is a new form of literacy. Look, capitalism and democracy are not the same thing. Let's begin there. Let's say that you can't talk about democracy if you're talking about capitalism. Because capitalism is the antithesis of democracy. Because capitalism doesn't believe in shared justice, in shared power, in shared responsibilities. It, it believes in accumulated profits. <laughs> That's very different, right? And so it seems to me that a debate over democracy, particularly in terms of linking three things, political rights, personal liberties, and economic rights. There is no democracy that does not talk about economic rights. It doesn't exist. I mean, you can have a, a range of personal freedoms and political individual freedoms, and I'm delighted with freedom of the press. And I'm delighted with the ability to go to choose any religion I want. But I'm not delighted with the notion that anybody can either sleep, sleep at the Ritz or sleep under a bridge. Sorry, doesn't work that way. I don't think any democracy is really worthy of the name because I don't think any democracy is finally finished or completed. I think that what democracy is and what I like about it is the fact that it represents an ideal in which no society is ever just enough. The concept at its best means it's unfinished. It's never fully completed. You always have to work at it. It's always a site of struggle. Gramsci says, he uses a term called the interregnum. He says, it's a period when the old order is dying and new societies are emerging. And in the middle is that moment of restlessness you know, that moment of uncertainty. That moment today is increasingly dominated by a fascist politics. It's dominated by right-wing groups, hate groups. It's dominated by people who hate immigrants, who hate refugees. It's dominated by neo-Nazis. It's dominated by white nationalists. And we need to be aware of that. I mean, we need to be aware that the language of democracy has been undermined by neoliberalism, by the, the hedge fund operators, by the capitalists, and we haven't been able to recover and so now we talk about illiberal democracy. We say in Hungary, in Poland, we say things like, we need a de democracy means that you don't really have, you have security, but you don't have freedom. You have to give up freedom for security. Can you imagine? That's the degree to which democracy has failed. Because you can't have a democracy without informed citizens. And that's why education has to be at the center of any discourse about democracy. And it isn't. And I think that's where the left has failed. The left has failed around education. They have failed because they believe that the most important structures of domination are entirely economic, and not only those elements that trade in beliefs and persuasion and pedagogy and changing consciousness and modes of identification. Uncertainties can be a time of great anxiety, and they can be a time of great possibility, a time to rethink the language of politics, to re rethink the language of struggle, rethink the language of solidarity. Power is not always about domination. It's not exclusively about domination. It's also about resistance. And young people have a lot of power. They can shut societies down. They can shut them down. They can block streets. They can engage in direct action. They can educate their parents. Uh, they're a potent political force. And I think that what they need to do is to recognize themselves as a potent political force. And I, need, I think they need to act because I think that uh, a discourse of anxiety should give way to a discourse of critique. And a discourse of critique should give way to a discourse of possibility. And a discourse of possibility means that you can imagine a future very different from the present.